15 of the best red dresses in cinematic history. Early on in this channel's inception, we had a video series which showcased an assortment of iconic dresses and films organized by color. Now, nearly three years later, we're revisiting the concept in our more in-depth video essay style, starting with red and ending with purple. In the original iteration of the series, any dresses that tickled my fancy were included, but from this point onward we'll be narrowing it down to the top 15 in no particular order, focusing on dresses with an interesting backstory, important symbolic meaning, a lasting cultural legacy, or simply look awesome. Now for a few disclaimers. There are tons of movies that have amazing costuming all around, and theoretically any of their outfits could be featured in this series, but for the sake of keeping things interesting, I'll try to keep repeats to a minimum. So before you get up in arms about a specific dress from a movie not making the cut, there's a high possibility that I decided to save it for a different episode. It's also important to keep in mind that I haven't seen every single film ever made, and it's highly possible that I might overlook a dress that you consider to be one of the best. So feel free to leave a comment down below if you didn't see your favorite, but just remember, this is all for fun, and there's no need to get in an argument over it. And it has to be said that this is based on my personal preferences, so if you see a recurring theme when it comes to the types of dresses included in this video, that's why. Red is one of the most popular colors in film, not only because it's visually dynamic, but because of what it symbolizes. With red being the color of romance, I was inspired to show myself a little bit of love, which for me means taking care of my body, which I'm not going to lie, I've been neglecting the last few years. Which brings me to today's sponsor, Care Of. As some of you may know, I've partnered with Care Of before in the past, and after seeing such great results, continuing to work with them on this new journey of self-love was a no-brainer. Care-of is a subscription service that helps you find the best vitamins and supplements for your needs while also making it fun and easy. Because my goals are a little bit different now than they were a few months ago, I retook Care-of's simple quiz and was recommended a new selection of vitamins and supplements. I was recommended vegetable collagen and vitamin D, which are supposed to help with your joints and bones. I was also recommended some B complex, which is supposed to help with your energy levels, but I've also noticed the added side effect of it helping with my hair health, which is just a bonus. I've always struggled to remember to take my vitamins every day, which is why I love Care-of's app. Besides helping me keep myself accountable, it's a really easy way to start developing the habit of taking your vitamins every day. Plus, there's the added bonus of being able to earn merch or even discounts. If you're also looking for a way to show your body some love, take care of's easy quiz to find out what they recommend to you. And you can use my code MODERNGIRLS50 for 50% off your first order. Now let's get back into the video. Romeo and Juliet Released in 1968, Romeo and Juliet was notable for being the first film adaptation of the Shakespearean play to use actors who were close in age to the characters, with then 15-year-old Olivia Hussey playing Juliet and 17-year-old Leonard Whiting playing Romeo. The film was especially popular with teenagers at the time, who saw Romeo and Juliet as stand-ins for themselves, with the characters' rebelliousness against their families resembling youth counterculture movements which similarly revolted against the establishment. Costume designer Danilo Donati had previously been nominated for an Oscar in 1966 for both Mandragola and The Gospel According to St. Matthew in the black and white costume design category, which yes, was a thing, and then again the following year for Taming of the Shrew alongside Irene Sheriff. Romeo and Juliet reunited him with director Franco Zeffirelli and the works of William Shakespeare, but Donati was given more control of the costuming this time around, which worked in the film's favor as they were able to prioritize historical accuracy instead of the actress's figure. Set in Verona during the Italian Renaissance, the costumes in the film have all of the usual quirks of clothing from the late 15th century, featuring bright jewel tones, lush fabrics, jeweled embellishments, thick skirts, and high waistlines. When Juliet is first introduced to the audience, she's wearing an embroidered gamura underneath a jornea, an overgown reserved for formal occasions. This overgown had to be expensive and ostentatious as it was evaluated by the outside world, being an indicator of the wearer's wealth and status. Juliet's jornea consists of panels of red and orange velvet, a fabric that was incredibly costly to produce at the time, thereby signaling to the other partygoers as well as the audience that Juliet comes from a family of means. Even Juliet's hair emphasizes this point, with the character's braid and Juliet cap, which takes its name from the character herself, being adorned with jewels. In the film, the Montague family wear shades of blue, while those loyal to the Capulets wear red, 
With the two colors being polar opposites, it highlights the hostility between the two houses, and much like fire and water, they can't coexist. This pays off later in the film when the two star-crossed lovers get married, with Juliet wearing a purple gown to the quiet ceremony, the combination of both of their family's colors. Considering the symbolism of the garment and its historical accuracy, it's hardly a surprise that Danilo Donati won an Oscar for Best Costume Design, although admittedly, there was pretty weak competition that year, and I have wondered if it would have still won if it had been released a year later, putting it up against Hello, Dolly! and Anne of the Thousand Days. However, Romeo and Juliet undoubtedly had a greater impact on culture as a whole. What with the film and its characters being so popular amongst teenagers, there was a renaissance revival in fashion, with velvet, embroidery, headdresses, jeweled embellishments, and overgowns trickling into the mainstream. You might see some similarities between this outfit and the one worn by Drew Barrymore at the end of 1998's Ever After. Taking place around the same time period, although Ever After is set in France instead of Italy, both movies have similar points of reference when it comes to their costuming, although I personally prefer the dress in Romeo and Juliet. Titanic A romantic drama which takes place on the infamous Titanic, the 1997 film was written, directed, and produced by James Cameron. A massive critical and commercial success, the film skyrocketed its young actors to superstardom, and became one of the highest grossing films of all time, as well as one of the most awarded at the Oscars. Our female lead, Rose DeWitt Bucader, is a young woman of high social standing. Controlled by both her mother and fiancé, Rose is deeply dissatisfied with her repetitive lifestyle and lack of independence. Outwardly, I was everything a well-brought-up girl should be. Inside, I was screaming. On board the Titanic, Rose meets and falls in love with Jack Dawson, a man who has none of her wealth or status, but lives the life of adventure that she yearns for. Rose wears this red dress on her first night on the ship while attending dinner with the rest of the first-class passengers, where she expresses her growing discontent to the audience. In a deleted scene, we see Rose return to her cabin, but when her maid is nowhere to be found, she's forced to remove her stuffy clothing herself, and grows frustrated at her inability to, a metaphor for the lack of control she has over her own life. Breaking down, she then decides to literally jump ship in order to escape her bleak circumstances, but is persuaded against doing so by Jack. Because of her disheveled appearance, when the ship's crew come across the two of them, they mistakenly believe that Jack has assaulted her, but Rose comes up with a lie to get them both off the hook. The film's costumes were designed by Deborah Lynn Scott, who was meticulous about their historical accuracy, even recreating real designs that were released around the time period. Taking inspiration from the latest Parisian fashions, Rose's attire is a reflection of her social status. In 1912, there were clearly defined rules in regard to etiquette, and everything from one's behavior to clothing were carefully examined. Keeping up with societal expectations, Rose wears the long gloves that were required for evening attire, with her dress featuring the open neckline and short sleeves of that time of day. Compared to the 1900s, the silhouette of the 1910s was softer and less exaggerated. Taking inspiration from classical antiquity, the era saw the rise of columnar skirts and high waistlines, creating a more natural look that moved away from the top-heavy S-shape. Headdresses were quite popular at the time, and in original sketches for the ensemble, Rose is pictured with a jeweled tiara, but it didn't make it into the film. The dress is tiered in the popular style of the period, having a train and layers made of sheer black chiffon with matching beaded embellishments and a beaded fringe. Several copies of the dress were made as the scene required stunt work, with Kate Winslet hanging off of a railing with a harness. And with all of the intricate beadwork and layers of fabric, each copy of the dress is estimated to have cost $10,000 to make and weighed three to four pounds, making it quite the heavy gown. In the wake of the film's success, people were clamoring for their own piece of the Titanic, and multiple companies obliged, recreating props and costumes from the film. The Heart of the Ocean necklace was famously sold by the J. Peterman Company, with official approval from 20th Century Fox, and the brand also replicated other pieces of Rose's wardrobe, including her red dress, which sold for $2,000. Sewing patterns were also made of the dress, allowing people to make their own version. Beetlejuice One of Tim Burton's first big movies, Beetlejuice has all of the usual markers of his playfully gothic style. The plot of the film revolves around a recently deceased couple who attempt to scare away their house's new inhabitants. After repeated failures, they contact the titular Beetlejuice, an irritating and immoral bio-exorcist who wants to wreak havoc on the mortal world. Aside from the antagonist, Lydia Dietz, played by Winona Ryder, is probably the best-remembered character in the film. 
Instead of neon spandex, pink prom dresses, and rosy cheeks, Lydia had jet black hair, dark circles, and offbeat outfits, making her the antithesis of the average 80s teen in film, turning her into the poster child for misfits. Only 15 when she started filming, Winona Ryder's personal style wound up influencing the direction of the character, even bringing her own petticoat to wear underneath the character's school uniform. But despite its kookiness, Lydia doesn't come across as a poser. According to costume designer Aggie Gerard Rogers, Tim Burton actually chose the dress himself from a selection of bridal gowns that she'd shown him in a magazine, asking if they could have it made in red. During the 1980s, there was a Victorian revival in fashion, which is immediately apparent in the design of Lydia's dress. This worked out wonderfully for the film, as gothic literature is often considered to have its heyday during that time period, making the dress immediately cohesive with the rest of the film's aesthetic. While the red wedding dress might feel like an obvious choice considering the film's aesthetic and the unconventional character, it actually has a hidden meaning. Taking inspiration from an old English rhyme, married in red, you'll wish yourself dead, it alludes to Lydia's circumstances. If I were being forced to marry Beetlejuice, I'd probably want to die too. Maybe it's just me, but I can't help but think that Jenna Ortega's black dress in Wednesday, another Tim Burton project, is an ode to this dress. They look remarkably similar. Last Holiday 2006's Last Holiday, loosely inspired by the 1950 film of the same name, stars Queen Latifah as Georgia Bird, an introverted and frugal woman working in a department store in New Orleans. After being told that she's going to die, she liquidates her assets, quits her job, and sets off on her dream vacation, determined to enjoy her final weeks. The costumes for the film were designed by Daniel Orlandi, who I actually had the pleasure of speaking to in preparation for this video. Orlandi started his career in film on the production of 1981's Pennies from Heaven, working as an assistant for the legendary designer Bob Mackie, who is known for his ostentatious designs that have been worn by everyone from Cher to Marilyn Monroe to Diana Ross. Orlandi worked for Mackey for several years before eventually setting out on his own, costuming films like Down With Love, The Blind Side, and Saving Mr. Banks. His prior experience working on glamorous costumes is immediately noticeable in Georgia's wardrobe, with a character wearing bright colors, bold patterns, and dramatic silhouettes once she starts living her life to the fullest. The character dons this iconic red dress on her first night out on the town. With her red pashmina billowing behind her, the dress appears elegant and reserved, but when it's removed, the dress is revealed to be rather daring, featuring a deep neckline and draped sleeves, mirroring the character's evolution in the story. The fact that most of the outfit's intricacies are on her torso shows Daniel Orlandi's attention to detail, as the majority of the scene is filmed with Queen Latifah in a seated position, and those are the areas that would be on camera. Besides the dress showing the dramatic change in the character's wardrobe and helping her pop amongst the rest of the crowd, red is also a shorthand for passion, and we can see this as the moment when Georgia's passion for life is reinvigorated. While Daniel Orlandi designed the dress, a friend of his, who had been the head dressmaker for Bob Mackie, was tasked with making it, as well as the green one Georgia wears later in the film. What makes the dress unique is that there's a layer of hot pink chiffon, which helps add depth and dimension, giving the dress its signature glow. Red and pink are also the colors for romance, lust, and flirtation, and this moment marks when both Chef Didier and Senator Dillings become romantically interested in her, making Georgia the target of three men's affection. Good for her. Although this dress might not be as extravagant as some others on this list, its appearance is a core memory for a lot of women my age, as it was one of the first times that we got to see a plus-sized woman depicted so fabulously and positively, with the character's story arc focusing on her confidence and self-acceptance, as opposed to an actual physical change. Plus, Queen Latifah just looks fabulous in it. The Princess Bride Although it's a fantasy film, the costumes in The Princess Bride take inspiration from the 14th and 15th centuries, resulting in a generically medieval wardrobe that isn't necessarily unique, but it is memorable. There were a good deal of movies with medieval settings released around this time period, like Excalibur and Ivanhoe, but I feel like compared to those, The Princess Bride doesn't feel as influenced by contemporary fashion trends. Our heroine, Buttercup, wears this red hoopalonde during the first act of the film. It isn't the fanciest of her gowns, but it is one of the most memorable, wearing it when she's captured by ruffians, reunited with Wesley, and returned to Prince Humperdinck. The hoopalonde was an outer garment worn by both men and women during the 14th and 15th centuries, with most featuring high necklines, long sleeves, and in the case of women, touched the floor. To emphasize the wearer's wealth and class, they were sometimes made long enough to extend into a train. 
Costume designer Phyllis Dalton made a dozen different versions of the dress in order to accommodate the stunt work and weather, accounting for the likely possibility that it would tear or get dirty. For the most part, Buttercup wears pastel colors, likely because Humperdinck wanted his future bride to look as demure as possible. This is juxtaposed by Buttercup's tenacious actions while wearing this bold red dress, with a character not only attempting to escape her captors, but also joining Wesley in the dangerous fire swamp. And her bravery is further highlighted when she swears to marry Humperdinck in exchange for Wesley's freedom. Considering this is what she's wearing when she's finally able to reunite with Wesley, it makes sense for it to be the color of love. The dress's bold color also allows for the character to be easily seen whether she's running in the woods, tumbling down a hill, climbing up a cliff, or swimming in the sea. Clueless A modern adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma, Clueless moves the classic story from Regency-era England to 90s LA. Cher Horowitz is a spoiled teenager who pokes her nose in other people's business, usually in regard to matters of love, despite having no experience herself. The movie is practically perfect in every way, but I credit a large part of its enduring popularity to the clothing, which while enviable, also helped tell the story. Besides the iconic yellow two-piece set at the beginning of the film, I'd argue that the red dress Cher wears to the party in the valley is probably the best remembered outfit in the Clueless universe, even being included in promotional materials. Although the film is riddled with iconic quotes, this is an Alaya is still one of my favorites, because as a fellow fashion lover, I too would hesitate at the idea of getting a designer dress dirty. And yes, it really was an Alaya. Costume designer Mona May recalled in an interview, quote, that was pre-PR. There was no one sending us clothes. We had to find somebody who knew how to get to Azadine Alaya and borrow the dress. But then we had to make sure that we can alter the dress to fit Alicia Silverstone. And it was going to be on the ground. So if it ever snags, can we return it? At the time of the movie's release, the brand was really only known by those in the fashion world. So the fact that Cher not only knows what it is, but also owns an Alaya dress, reveals that she's not your run-of-the-mill shopping-obsessed teen, but is actually knowledgeable and passionate about the subject. Styled with red pumps and a feather trim peplum jacket, it's one of Cher's more glamorous ensembles. Which is interesting, considering the party is rather casual. Although considering it's Christmas, she is on theme. Bram Stoker's Dracula while the character of Dracula is an incredibly popular archetype, appearing on screen since the dawn of the film industry, Francis Ford Coppola took the character in a steamy new direction in his 1992 adaptation of Bram Stoker's 1897 novel. Starring Gary Oldman, Winona Ryder, Anthony Hopkins, and Keanu Reeves, the film set off a bustle craze in Hollywood, and in the 10 years following its release, Little Women, Far and Away, Tombstone, Age of Innocence, The Portrait of a Lady, Miss Julie, Wild Wild West, Jude, and Original Sin hit theaters. And that was just the tip of the Victorian iceberg. A love story as much as it is a horror film, Dracula follows the titular character as he travels from Transylvania to London in order to meet and woo Mina Harker, the reincarnation of his beloved wife, Elisabetta. Mina is already engaged to another man, but finds herself drawn to Count Dracula regardless, eventually joining him as his bride. The film's Oscar-winning costumes were designed by the legendary Eiko Ishioka, who was also responsible for the stunning costumes in The Cell, The Fall, and Mirror Mirror. Early on, director Francis Ford Coppola declared that the costumes will be the set, and picked Ishioka for the project personally, having fallen in love with her work as a graphic artist years earlier. Funnily enough, Ishioka had never seen a vampire film before, which worked in her favor as it allowed her to create a unique aesthetic that was uninfluenced by Dracula's of the past. Mina begins the film clad in soft greens and leafy motifs highlighting her purity and innocence, while also drawing parallels to the outfit worn by the deceased Elisabetta. The first time she steps out of this green color palette is when she joins Dracula for dinner, remembering her past life and admitting her love for him. A gift from Dracula, the dress is a huge departure from the rest of her wardrobe. Mina's dresses were rather conservative up until this point, drawing a stark comparison to her more outgoing and sexual friend Lucy. And this red dress is a noticeably more sensual silhouette. Showing far more skin, especially around her neck, the dress is an obvious symbol of the character's desire and her corruption. The dress is still adorned with the character's signature leaf motifs, but in red they almost look like thorns, drawing parallels to Dracula's fangs, which similarly draw blood. Red was a recurring theme in Ishioka's work, and I even considered putting the peacock dress from Mirror Mirror on this list. But in Dracula, the color holds a more significant meaning than its usual connotations of passion, love, and death. 
Within the film, red is heavily associated with Dracula himself. Besides being the color of blood, much of his clothing is red, such as his robe and armor. And by wearing the dress, it shows that Mina has not only allowed herself to be seduced by him, but foreshadows that she too will become a vampire. The elaborate bustle, which is a work of art, cascades down her backside, resembling a waterfall, perhaps alluding to all of the blood Dracula has shed in order to reunite them. If we're being technical, the silhouette of most of the dresses in the film are about a decade off of when they should be, considering the bustle had already died off by the film's 1897 setting, with the S-shape or pigeon breast growing in popularity. But when the dresses are this gorgeous, does it really matter? Anna Karenina Now let's take a look at a dress that was criticized for not having a bustle. Considered one of the greatest works of literature, Leo Tolstoy's 1878 novel Anna Karenina has been adapted to film on multiple occasions, but the 2012 adaptation took on a more theatrical and stylized approach, with the events of the film being presented as if it were a stage play. Keeping that in mind, the film was very deliberate in its rejection of reality, something which mirrors the state of mind of its main character and is similarly reflected in her wardrobe. As a result, the film has a pretty bad rap within the historical costuming community, but that's usually because they're interacting with the wardrobe exclusively from a period accuracy standpoint instead of a storytelling device. Director Joe Wright has never been a stickler for historical accuracy when it comes to his period pieces, as seen with the costumes in both Atonement and Pride and Prejudice. Instead, he opts for costumes that are believably historical, while at the same time being accessible to a modern audience, thereby allowing them to infer certain things about the characters more easily. While someone with a degree in fashion history would be able to recognize the subtleties of the era, like wearing an evening dress in the daytime, your average moviegoer probably wouldn't understand what makes such a thing so scandalous, which is where the anachronistic choices in the costuming of Anna Karenina come into play. Instead of a faithful interpretation of the novel's 1870 setting, as seen in the 1997 film, costume designer Jacqueline Duran took inspiration from a more recent time period, saying, quote, I looked at lots of 50s couture, and I looked at photographs and drawings of 1870s costumes and came up with a hybrid of the two. It was really about getting the shape of the 1870s and taking away all of the trimmings and laying really recognizable 50s details on top, which I hope made it clear that I'm not trying to do accurate period costumes. Clothing from the 1950s is remembered for being elegant and romantic, while also being stiff and structured, which mirrors Anna's inner conflict between desire and decency. Anna's red dress is perhaps the most obvious with its contemporary inspirations, which makes sense as it's a pivotal moment in the film and for the character. Although Count Vronsky and Anna's open flirtations have stirred up gossip amongst the St. Petersburg aristocrats, up until this point Anna has managed to keep her feelings somewhat at bay. But after being confronted with the possibility that she and Vronsky will no longer be able to meet, she admits her feelings to him and they sleep together. With red being associated with passion, love, lust, danger, and death, could there be a better dress to express that Anna is willing to throw away her honor in exchange for love? not to mention foreshadow her unfortunate demise as a direct result of said romance. Like most of the gowns in the film, it's made up of two parts, a bodice and a skirt. While the full skirts that Anna wears throughout the film are a far cry from the slim silhouettes of the 1870s, it wouldn't have been that inaccurate a choice if the film were set just 10 years earlier, as the crinolines of the 1860s were still rather round and large. The bodice, however, doesn't have much in common with any fashions of the 19th century besides being structured, as it shows far too much skin, even for evening wear. But as we've said, historical accuracy wasn't the point, with the film even going as far as giving Anna jewelry from Chanel, who hadn't even been born yet. These anachronistic choices solidify the surrealist nature of the film while also highlighting that the themes of the story are relevant regardless of time period. Although Jacqueline Duran is quite the controversial figure, having been responsible for the oft-lambasted costuming in 2017's live-action Beauty and the Beast and 2019's Little Women, I think it's clear that in the case of Anna Karenina, the things people hated about the costumes were done on purpose. I can understand the importance of historical accuracy in a traditional period piece, but there's nothing traditional about this adaptation of Anna Karenina, and the ahistorical costuming is an important part of its storytelling. Gone with the Wind Oh, you thought we were done with the Victorian era? You wish. 1939's Gone with the Wind, with costumes designed by Walter Plunkett, is considered one of the greatest period dramas of all time, with the characters' wardrobes being accurate to the time period, albeit with a dash of the 1930s, while also having symbolic meaning. 
our protagonist, Scarlett O'Hara, has been in love with the spineless Ashley Wilkes for most of her adult life, in spite of both of them being married to other people and Ashley never actually committing to Scarlett in the slightest. After being caught in an embrace, the entire town is ablaze with gossip about the pair, and Scarlett, out of shame and fear, plans to miss Ashley's birthday party so as to not have to confront his wife, Melanie. Scarlett's husband, Rhett Butler, forces her to attend, choosing her attire himself. Melanie, ever kind-hearted and Scarlett's one true friend, stands by her side, forcing the rest of the guests to accept Scarlett back into their good graces. In order to show the progression of time, Plunkett placed emphasis on the shape of Scarlett's gowns, as seen most clearly with the silhouette of her morning attire. When the film begins in 1861, Scarlett's dresses feature the signature circle-shaped skirts of the era, a silhouette made possible by hoop skirts, aka the caged crinoline. Following the war and her marriage to Rhett Butler, the volume in Scarlett's skirts swings towards the rear, a fashion trend which signaled the start of the early bustle era. As time continues to pass, her dresses transition into a more tight-fitted silhouette, also known as the natural form era which left the bustles at home and introduced the popular princess line, which Scarlett's dress takes inspiration from. Scarlett's red dress is figure-hugging and revealing, hardly the type of dress one would wear when being accused of adultery, something that Scarlett herself is aware of, which is why she's resistant to the ensemble, only wearing it when forced to by Rhett. Made of velvet and featuring feather trim and beadwork, the dress is not only eye-catching, forcing Scarlett into the spotlight, but it also highlights the butler's exorbitant wealth, making her appear even more selfish and shallow in front of the rest of her peers. With the gauzy wrap, Scarlett's ensemble resembles one worn earlier in the film by Belle Watling, with the implication being that Rhett equates Scarlett's actions to that of a prostitute, hence his insistence that she wear lots of rouge, which at the time was seen as improper and even vulgar. Wear that. Nothing modest or matronly will do for this occasion. And put on plenty of rouge. I want you to look your part tonight. Interestingly, in the novel, Scarlett's gown during the sequence is described as jade green with pink velvet roses. Obviously, this was abandoned. Author Margaret Mitchell's choice to go with a green dress made sense for the novel's Victorian setting, as green was considered fashionable and was an indication of wealth, but the pigments used to create the color were highly toxic, even leading to death on occasion. With safer alternatives being created, green had a very different connotation for 1930s audiences, and as a result in the film, the color is used to symbolize greed, vanity, and envy. Meanwhile in the film, red was used to symbolize love, lust, and scandal, thereby making it the ideal choice for this specific scene. Producer David O. Selznick also thought that red was more befitting an adulterer, as in The Scarlet Letter. Inglorious Bastards a revisionist look at World War II by director Quentin Tarantino, one of Inglorious Bastards' plotlines follows Shoshana Dreyfus, a French Jewish woman who has been living in hiding following the murder of her family years earlier. Seeking revenge, she hatches a plan to kill a group of war criminals by trapping them inside of a theater and burning it down during a film premiere. There's an entire sequence dedicated to Shoshana getting ready for this climactic evening, which you could interpret as the character preparing for battle, with her dress serving as a suit of armor and her rouge being a not-so-subtle ode to indigenous war paint. In this moment, Shoshana is weaponizing her femininity, forcing others to let down their guard by seeing her as nothing more than a pretty face, a point that is clearly made when Shoshana kills Frederick Zoller after tricking him into thinking she's finally given in to his sexual advances. This entire look pays homage to the femme fatales of the 1940s, with Shoshana filling a similar role in the film, leading to the downfall of numerous men, while also meeting a dramatic end herself. Up until this point, Shoshana had dressed in simple, plain clothes, hoping to go unnoticed in a city crawling with people who would kill her. But here she says to hell with it, deciding to dress to the nines if she's going to meet her maker. She also accessorizes with a black veiled pillbox hat, making her look like she's going to a funeral. But the question is, is she dressed for hers or someone else's? Red is inescapable during this sequence, with everything from her lipstick, nails, and wine being the color. This cleverly juxtaposes the end of the evening, which is riddled with blood and flames. Most of the other men and women attending the premiere are wearing black or white, and by wearing red, Shoshana is able to stand out immediately, even if her outfit is simple in comparison to others. The one thing that Shoshana does match are the Nazi flags, which is ironic as she's their very downfall. While I couldn't imagine a different dress for this moment, it wasn't always the plan, with costume designer Anna Shepard saying, quote, 
Originally, I designed a short black dress for her, which Quentin liked very much, but I talked him into a change of heart. I thought that in the black dress, her character would disappear because she's so tiny. Thank God they changed it to red. Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen Starring Lindsay Lohan as the titular drama queen, the film follows teenager Lola Stepp after she moves from New York City to the suburbs of New Jersey. The film's costumes were designed by David C. Robinson, who also worked on Zoolander and the Lizzie McGuire movie, and he did an amazing job of developing the character through her kooky and creative clothing choices. I have a video all about it that I'd highly recommend checking out. Lola wears a ton of memorable outfits in the movie, but the red dress is undoubtedly my favorite, likely because it pays homage to one of my favorite movies. Lola's school is putting on a modern adaptation of the 1913 play Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw, which follows the rough around the edges Eliza Doolittle after she's taken in by Professor Henry Higgins, who sets out to teach her how to walk, talk, and act like a proper lady. The play was later adapted into the 1956 musical My Fair Lady, which starred Julie Andrews, the musical was then adapted to film in 1964, with Audrey Hepburn playing the lead role. In the film, Eliza goes to the races at Ascot as a trial run of her abilities, where she's given a grand reveal in a black and white floor-length gown designed by Cecil Beaton. What you might not have realized is that the red dress in Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen is a contemporary take on that very same outfit. While it's a different color and silhouette, there are some small details that make the inspiration obvious, but with the dress in Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen being shorter, strapless, sequined, and brightly colored, it's more fitting for the film's 21st century setting and Lola's playful personality. I also love how the dress plays into the character's circumstances. When Eliza's attending the Ascot races in My Fair Lady, she's attempting to deceive others into thinking she's someone of importance and of higher standing, which unfortunately ends in an embarrassing failure. Lola has a similar experience when wearing the red dress, with her lies about her father finally catching up to her and causing a rift between her and her friend. The dress appears on screen on three separate occasions, each time looking a little different. When Lola steals it from school in order to attend the Sid Arthur concert, she styles it with a matching sequin bolero, furthering the similarities to the original dress as it features fluted sleeves and a high collar. When Megan Fox wears it during a fitting right before the play, we see the dress at its base level, which while cute, is nothing extraordinary. When it finally appears in the context of the school play, it's accessorized with white opera gloves and a long 1920s inspired cocoon coat with a fringe, making it more elegant than its other iterations. My favorite is the first, but what's yours? Tale of Tales this highly underrated fantasy horror film is inspired by three fairy tales collected by Jean Battista Bazil in the 1630s. An ode to the story of the enchanted doe, Salma Hayek stars as the queen of Long Trellis, who has been unable to conceive a child. After listening to the advice of a necromancer, the queen eats the heart of a sea dragon, but loses her husband in the process. The following day, she and the cook give birth to identical boys, who grow up to become inseparable friends. The queen conspires to murder the other boy, but he's able to escape. The queen's son eventually leaves as well, and the queen sends all of her subjects to search for him before turning to the necromancer for help once again, although she's warned that what she desires will only lead to bloodshed. The film's costumes were designed by Massimo Cantina Perini, with assistance from the legendary atelier Torelli Costumi. Much of the clothing takes inspiration from the early 17th century, and in the case of the queen, seemed to be heavily influenced by popular fashions in Spain, with the character and her court often wearing black. The one exception to the somber color palette is the red gown the queen wears while chasing her son through a labyrinth. With billowing sleeves and a train, the dress allows her to physically take up more space, highlighting her overbearing and controlling nature. The red in the dress is symbolic of the love that she has for her son, while the black embroidery makes it clear to the audience that there's a darkness to that. Said embroidery is actually antique from the 18th century, grounding the fantastical dress in reality. The Dressmaker Based on the 2000 novel by Rosalie Hamm, the dressmaker follows Tilly as she returns to her small Australian hometown in order to take care of her ailing mother. Tilly had left town years earlier after being accused of a crime, and moved to Europe where she studied under numerous couturiers. Using these sewing skills, she decides to shake up the sleepy old town and get revenge on those who wronged her in the past. A story about revenge and love, the film switches between comedy and tragedy on a whim, leaving the audience wondering if they should laugh or cry. The film had two costume designers, Marion Boyce and Margot Wilson, with Wilson being in charge of Tilly's wardrobe while Boyce was responsible for everyone else's. 
While this was pretty standard practice back in the 1950s, nowadays it's uncommon to have a single costume designer dedicated to one character, but having two different designers actually worked in the dressmaker's favor as it allowed for Tilly's wardrobe to immediately differ from the rest of the townsfolk. Wilson said of the character, quote, we wanted Tilly to have an effortless, well-tailored style. The designs reflected Tilly's strength in the solid colors and simple lines. Her clothes were her armor and her strength, and they also become her weapon. To juxtapose this, the clothes she designs for the town's women are softer and more romantic, making it immediately apparent to the audience that they're no threat to Tilly, whose structured silhouettes and solid colors are immediately intimidating. Taking place in 1951, Tilly's wardrobe is a reflection of the post-war era, with Dior's new look influencing the character's unabashedly feminine style. Is that, uh, Dior? Very good, Sergeant Ferret. My design, but Dior inspired. Tilly wears this red dress to a football match as a statement. In a total power move, she distracts the players with her eye-catching ensemble, illustrating the control she has over the townspeople. She also uses it to prove a point to the other women, showing them that sexuality can be used as a weapon, and that a good dress can make all the difference in the world. This was actually Margot Wilson's favorite costume in the entire film, with the designer purchasing the fabric 25 years earlier, waiting for the perfect project to use it for. 102 Dalmatians Contemporary costume design is rarely given the time of day when it comes to major awards, so it's a huge testament to Anthony Powell's immense talent that 102 Dalmatians, a children's film, was nominated for an Oscar for Best Costume Design. Everything Corella wears in this film is utterly fabulous, but there's something about this red dress that I find to be a cut above the rest. And before anyone says it, this is without a doubt better than the dress Emma Stone wore in the 2021 live action. Like, it's not even close. A sequel, the film begins with a reformed Cruella who no longer has any interest in killing animals or wearing furs. After being released from prison, she sets out to rebuild her reputation, donating to charities and dog shelters, but she eventually reverts back to her original personality, vowing to get her hands on her spotted Dalmatian coat. Cruella wears this red gown at a banquet she hosts to distract the Dalmatian's owners while she kidnaps their puppies, and we see a portrait of one of her many ancestors on the wall behind her. The painting is inspired by the Ditchley portrait of Queen Elizabeth I, just with more red, white, and black incorporated into it, as well as Corella's signature two-toned hair. Corella's gown takes inspiration from the Elizabethan era of fashion, combined with elements of 90s haute couture. Like Queen Elizabeth, her dress features a stiff bodice and ruff, while the overskirt resembles the queen's hanging sleeves. Powell also seemed to draw inspiration from the designs of Thierry Mugler, giving the look a contemporary edge and sensuality, as well as paying homage to the character's backstory as a fashion designer. Up until this point, Corella had been keeping her true intentions hidden, wearing mostly white and black, but with the character deciding to reveal her plan, there's no attempt at looking pure or innocent, and she embraces her villainy wholeheartedly by wearing red from head to toe. Embroidered with sequins and beads, it almost looks like she's on fire, which certainly sells Cruella's devilish nature, but it's also very glamorous. According to Anthony Powell's notes on the character, the brief from the directors was the devil meets Folie Bergère. While the character is known for her penchant for animal furs, this dress features dyed ostrich feathers, showing how she's happy with anything as long as there's animal cruelty involved. It's also important to note that her dress is practically the polar opposite of what Chloe wears, mirroring the characters' differing personalities. My favorite fun fact about this movie is that Glenn Close had it written into her contract that she would get to keep every single outfit, and I could not be more jealous. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace Regardless of what your thoughts are on the Star Wars prequels, there's no arguing that its costuming is absolutely phenomenal, especially when it comes to the wardrobe of Padme Amidala, played by Natalie Portman. The clothing in the original Star Wars film was heavily inspired by the wardrobe of samurai, monks, and farmers of feudal-era Japan. The prequel series is less consistent with its cultural inspirations, with costume designer Trisha Bigger taking notes from everything from Mongolian bridal wear to Victorian morning attire to Roman toga. Although all of Padme's outfits are similarly eye-catching, there isn't a cohesive aesthetic across all three films, which makes the world of Naboo and Padme's style philosophy a touch confusing from a cultural standpoint. Over the course of the entire prequel trilogy, the character wears 61 unique costumes, 
but one of her most memorable ensembles is her throne room dress, which she wears when the character is first introduced in 1999's The Phantom Menace. A thick floor-length gown with embroidery and fur trim, the dress took eight weeks to make and takes inspiration from traditional clothing from Tibet and Mongolia. What gives the dress an alien-like edge is the round lights placed into the bottom of the skirt, which were made to resemble ladybugs. Only 14 at this point in the series, Padme's wardrobe reflects her age, with her stuffy ceremonial gowns highlighting her desire to be taken seriously by those around her, while her peasant wear allows her to let her guard down and be a kid for once. This juxtaposes what she wears in the second film, as Padme is no longer a teenager or a queen, and her wardrobe becomes more elegant and feminine as she falls in love with Anakin. Throughout the film, Padme wears red, often accompanied by black and gold. Unlike many of the other dresses in this video, which take inspiration from the West, this dress is heavily influenced by Asian cultures, and as a result its color symbolism is different than what you'd usually expect. Instead of red being symbolic of love or death, in China it represents power and vitality, often being worn by nobility, which draws parallels to Padme's own role as a ruler. The makeup is an equally important part of this outfit, as it is only worn when Padme is acting as queen, making her duty to Naboo an inescapable part of her identity. The all-white foundation is reminiscent of Oshiroi, which is used by both Japanese geisha and kabuki actors. The two dots on her cheeks are based on traditional Korean bridal makeup, which symbolized a bride's youth and virginity and was a charm to chase away evil spirits. Her lipstick takes notes from popular makeup trends of the Qing dynasty, which similarly had a painted upper lip while the lower lip was only dotted in the center. Fans have also theorized that the dress is paying homage to the ensemble in 1944's Cobra Woman, which is worn by the high priestess of the island. Can you think of any red dresses that should have made this list? With orange coming up in the next episode, what are your favorite orange dresses in film? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon! Bye!